the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative and the Ohio chapter of the Wildlife Society. My name is Ken Duran and I will be your host today. For those of you who are new to the presentation series, you can view all of our previous webinars by going to the link on the top of the page. Uh, we are recording today's webinar and we'll post it to uh, this website as well so you can share with your friends or colleagues. Uh, if you have any questions today about uh, the presentation or if you're having technical difficulties, Amanda Duran will be taking those questions and we'll be able to help you through any technical issues you have or we'll forward on your question to our presenter. Just go ahead and type it, uh, any questions you have in the chat box on your screen as seen on, this, uh, on the screen right here. Now on to, to the main topic today. Uh, Dr. Mike Tonkovich has been the deer biologist for the Ohio Division of Wildlife from 1995 to 2013. And then in early 2013, he was promoted to the deer program administrator. Uh, Dr. Tonkovich has a master's and a PhD in fisheries and wildlife sciences from Virginia Tech. His professional interests include human dimensions of wildlife management, particularly as it relates to Ohio's deer program. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tonkovich. Thank you, Ken. I assume that everybody can, uh, can see the title there. Oh, when things slow down a bit for the deer program, because at the time I was too busy to even think about a topic, so a couple weeks out, Ken approaches me and says, Mike, I need a title. And I don't even have a topic, let alone a title. So naturally, panic sets in, and I revert to the basics which is rule one in public speaking, know your audience. Uh, and then I realized uh, the problem is the reality of webinars, you don't even know you have an audience, uh, let alone who they are. So I go to plan B, which is to pick a topic that I believe to be an important part of the DEER program, uh, but have yet to prepare a formal presentation on. So here we are, uh, DEER management cooperatives. Uh, is, it, is it relevant? I would argue certainly yes, especially when you consider that more than 95% of Ohio's DEER reside on private property and secondly, interest in deer management has never been greater. And I think as you'll see here in just a minute, Ohio in particular and the Midwest in general are both great fits for co-ops. For that reason, we'll spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about co-ops. So obviously, we're going to begin with a definition of what a co-op is. That's a, that's a natural place to start this. We'll talk about why co-ops. There's several reasons why I think Co-ops need to be part of the deer management toolbox um, here in the state of Ohio and many other states uh, uh, across the Midwest in particular. Uh, very briefly, we'll talk about how co-ops uh, function, how you begin a co-op, something that you want to do, where do you go for resources. We'll talk a little bit about that. I need to spend a little bit of time on terminology. Uh, there's, there's a bit of confusion out there with respect to acronyms and terminology, so I want to clear a few things up. Spend just a couple minutes talking about that. Uh, I want to talk just briefly about um, a conversation I had with a Ohio co-op member, Kurt Yoder. Kurt is a, a member of one of the largest and probably the most successful co-ops here in the state, in Coshocton County. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, some of the things, sharing with you some of the things that, that uh, Kurt and I talked about with respect to uh, what I think some of the most important aspects of, of co-ops. And then finally, I want to close with uh, you know the question, address the rhetorical question, pipe dream or, or pipe wrench, do co-ops uh, belong in the agency's toolbox? And I think, um, I think they most certainly do, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is. So in its simplest form, if you look at the definition of a co-op, it's, it's really nothing more than a farm, a business, or other organization that is owned and run jointly by its members who share uh, the profits or benefits. We take that a bit, a bit further and, and define what a wildlife cooperative is, and that's really nothing more than a, a group of neighboring landowners, hunters, and conservationists working together towards common goals of enhanced wildlife populations, better hunting opportunities on their collective landscape through cooperative habitat management, harvest management, and education. Now, if we narrow that a bit further and talk about a deer management cooperative, you can see that it's nothing but a group, group of folks whose primary interest in deer, specifically a group of landowners and hunters working together to improve the quality of deer, her, the quality of the deer herd and hunting experience on their collective area. And I want to emphasize at this point, it, it's really important to point out that, that co-ops are not just about hunters. Of course, they involve landowners, oftentimes will include landowners who may find themselves with more deer than what they want. So the, the, the association or the, the 
the, uh, the group of hunters working together may help the landowner uh, resolve some of his deer management issues as well. I think it's equally important that we talk about what a, what a co-op is not. And, and first and foremost, it's, it's not a land grab. Uh, land grab. Uh, the group makes decisions for the property as a whole, but property owners retain the rights. In other words, I don't take my half an acre and join it with an existing co-op that's 10,000 acres and all of a sudden assume uh, that I have access to all of that property. Also, it's worth noting that a co-op, of course, is not for everyone. Uh, and closely related, it's not practical everywhere. So co-ops don't fit everywhere. They're not for everyone. And, and I think equally as important, uh, it's important to recognize that co-ops are not a privatization of deer management. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But I think it's important that we make that very, very clear that just because we're helping folks with uh, deer management issues on private property, we're not talking about privatizing uh, deer management. And certainly, uh, co-ops are not new. Co-ops began, um, I believe, in the mid-1950s in Texas. And, and as a result of interest in deer management, particularly in the mid-1990s, there was a growing interest uh, in co-ops uh, in the Midwest, which uh, I think, as you'll see here in just a little, a little bit, where member benefits tend to be the greatest because of property size. Um, there are presently more than 50 co-ops uh, in the state of Michigan alone. And recently, uh, the state of Missouri Department of Conservation partnered with the QDMA to fund a full-time co-op position there. So co-ops certainly are nothing new. <clears throat> so what about co-ops? Why would, why would we, as a state agency, uh, want to spend time talking about, uh, about deer management co-ops? I'm sure this is news to no one, but deer are not evenly distributed across the landscape, uh, nor is there anything new about the way that uh, agencies, including Ohio, are managing deer today, with one exception. That is, the job is getting harder, plain and simple. Uh, as landscapes be continue to become more fragmented and more diverse and ownership patterns change, uh, managing a large area with a single regulation uh, is nearly impossible. Uh, of course, no surprise to anyone. Yet, we continue to cast a, a single regulation net, if you will, across DMUs, whether they're counties or, or larger areas. And in the process, uh, we carve out craters and, and create mountains of deer elsewhere. So as I see it, uh, property owners slash deer managers have a couple of choices here today. They can continue to be frustrated by their continued lack of success on their property and channel that negative energy into pro unproductive rants, typically uh, directed towards the DEER program or the DEER program uh, administrator or become engaged or the alternative is they can become engaged in the DEER management process, which is, of course, why we're here today. So why all the frustration? Um, frankly, it boils down to size, uh, size of the average white-tailed deer home range versus uh, the property size being managed. The average deer home range is several times larger than the average property size, at least here in the Midwest, and that, of course, creates lots of challenges for folks that are trying to manage deer. Another illustration here that might help make that point a little clearer, uh, in the slide you'll see the green polygons represent unique property owners, each managing or attempting to manage deer on their own property. The dash lines represent annual deer home ranges, and the reality is deer use the landscape at a much larger scale than most of us are able to affect or exert an influence on. And as I've tried to illustrate here, the blue rounded rectangle uh, in, the, in the slide represents the uh, annual use um, of, uh, of a deer, uh, multiple deer home ranges. Finally, uh, one final illustration I like to use, um, which is also kind of fun to make the point about the difference in scale between a deer's home range and the typical footprint of a landowner here in the Midwest. What you're looking at is this slide illustrates a single bucks movement um, in early November is actual movement data for a radio marked buck, mature buck in Pennsylvania in 2004, I believe, early November 2004. And you'll notice that the linear distance from the top to the bottom of the slide is over a mile and a quarter. Uh, as it turns out, this buck traveled nearly seven miles in just over a day, which, of course, is not your typical uh, daily movements. But it serves to illustrate, I think, the point that if we're going to have a positive impact on a deer population, we may have to think way outside of our property. And for illustration purposes, the white polygon in the upper left corner may represent a single farm. Finally, on the, uh, the specifics of why a co-op, uh, I want to share with you some Ohio-specific property information, compliments of, of Gabe Carnes, our postdoc at OSU. 
What we're looking at here is land parcel data from a handful of Ohio counties for illustration purposes. And we'll go through a few slides and then compare these means with average home range sizes, average home range sizes, excuse me, for male and female white-tailed deer from nearby states. The first slide is simply uh, total land area divided by total number of parcels within the county to get uh, a mean parcel size. Nothing real fancy here, of course, and, and uh, all figures in the next series of slides are going to be in acres. But you can see, um, you know, we're not talking about very large sizes. The means are very, very low, with the exception of Benton County. You know, just over 30 acres is the average parcel size there. Brown County, eight and a half. Uh, Licking County, four and a half, and Putnam County, uh, just over just over 10 acres in size. Now what we've got here is we've, we've got these means are based solely on those parcels of land that are greater than five acres in size. So we've excluded everything less than five acres. And as you can see, this makes a huge difference for Brown, Licking, and Putnam counties. But still, uh, at the end of the day, we're still talking about average, um, average parcel size of less than 50 acres. Finally, what we've done here is we've rolled up all the parcels by uh, owner <clears throat> that were at least five acres in size. And you can see that uh, this has bumped both Brown and Licking County a bit. But still, the average landowner in these two counties accounts for less than 50 acres. And I should also mention that we're not even talking necessarily about parcels that are adjacent to each other. These could be parcels separated by uh, other, other property owners. Story reads a bit differently in Benton County. Uh, and this is largely due to the public land there. So of course, drum roll and, and ask the question, how does this compare with average home range size of uh, male and female white-tailed deer? And I think there's really um, no one that will be surprised to see this. When we look at males from, uh, from several uh, nearby states here in Ohio, from West Virginia, uh, Iowa, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, we can see the average home range size. For males, it varies, of course, depending on the time of year we're talking about in the age class. But, but generally, anywhere from just over 300 acres to almost 1,000 acres in size. Females, of course, a little bit smaller, uh, just over a couple hundred acres to uh, just over 600 acres. But the fact of the matter is we're dealing with um, huge differences between average home range size, of course, and average uh, property size controlled by a particular landowner. So why co-ops? Um, and to be quite honest, if you haven't got it at this point, at least from a very, very practical standpoint, you've either been dozing or multitasking. Um, very simply, a, a co-op may help to reconcile the large differences between the average home range size of a deer and the average property size, at, at least what we're dealing with here in the Midwest. At the end of the day, uh, what a co-op will do for um, your landowners is, is they it will allow small property owners to reap the benefits that come with large land holdings. But as you'll see here in just a second, they're really so that's the practical side to it, but, but I think there's much more to it than, than that. I'd like to consider a few more things before we move on. Um, <clears throat> I think it connects people with the deer management process uh, until that connection is made. Our data, whether it be harvest, herd condition, or hunter effort, will always be questioned uh, some, in some states more than others, regardless if it is actually representative of the property in question or not. Um, I also think that some learn by reading, others by doing. I know that I graduated from the School of Hard Knocks. Um, Co-op members find out firsthand that you can't have your cake, uh, quantity in this case, and eat it too, quality. Some members, uh, some folks will understand this, but most have to experience it. And again, there is that, uh, there is that School of Hard Knocks. And finally, and perhaps for selfish reasons, as the DEER program administrator, um, I think that co-ops are important from the standpoint that they get people, give people a greater understanding of the complexity uh, of the DEER management process that we are involved in, in, and it will help build constituent support for the, for the very difficult task uh, that we do, or at least attempt to do. Finally, co-ops uh, can form the basis of advocacy groups, uh, and together the network of co-ops can represent an organized voice uh, for sportsmen and for sportswomen. Co-ops can serve, I believe, at least. Co-ops can, can serve as a productive conduit to the State Fish and Game Agency, and I emphasize productive. And finally, co-ops can lead to increased hunter satisfaction among members. I'd like to say that just Mike, can I inter uh, inter interrupt you for one second? Sure. Uh, we have a question here. Um, Dan Long is asking, why not? Why can't we have our cake and eat it too? Why can't we have quantity and quality for deer? 
Uh, I think I think Dan, that's that. that, that um, I think those are mutually exclusive in most cases. I mean, you look at most states that are harvesting or sending most most. Um, and when I, I suppose I should qualify that too a bit, Dan. Uh, I'm not talking, you know, from a quantity standpoint, I'm talking about traditional deer management where you, the goal is simply to put as many deer behind every tree, not maximize, not, not maximize annual hunter harvest but necessarily, but put a deer behind every tree. So from a traditional standpoint, you can't, have, you can't do traditional deer management and quality deer management at the same time. So great question. I hope that clarifies that for you. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so back to back to the uh, back to the quality of the uh, the hunter satisfaction issue. I know this is kind of a deviation for just a second, but um, I'd like to spend just a couple minutes talking about hunter satisfaction because I think it's extremely relevant in the context of, of co-ops and and you know I guess uh, in the context of running a state fish and game agency. Uh, satisfied hunters, of course, by by licenses, and I think that's obviously something that we need to be be uh, be aware of and and, and constantly. Be mindful of, but but if we take just a few examples and, and talk about uh, talk about hunter uh, hunter satisfaction, I, as I'm sure many of you know, either from direct personal or, or perhaps professional experience, determinants of hunter satisfaction are many uh, and they vary considerably across species. But one thing that seems to be universal is that killing something is rarely uh, a primary determinant of a quality hunt. As I mentioned here, just a few examples. So if we look at some turkey data from Ohio. Dave Swanson found that over 85% of turkey hunters uh, ranked high gobbling activity as the primary factor contributing greatly to enjoyment uh, of their spring turkey hunting experience, followed by killing an adult turkey and culling turkeys uh, just behind that. If we look at Idaho uh, elk hunters and what managers need to be aware of there, some of the research that, that came out of this project, uh, the authors stated that managers must understand that management uh, of a healthy elk population, of healthy elk populations and harvest control are only the beginning uh, if Idaho elk hunters are to achieve quality experiences. Uh, managers have the power to affect changes and to direct their attention to other equally important attributes of quality identified in this study. And finally, uh, I'd like to look at uh, Michigan deer hunter cooperatives and the, and the hunter satisfaction of the members in, in those, uh, those cooperatives. Um, the overall hunter satisfaction in that group increased uh, as a result of participation in the co-op increased from 44% to 75% after joining a co-op. Uh, in that same region, the DNR uh, there in Michigan surveyed hunters and found that uh, hunter satisfaction was only at 46%. So the point I'd like to leave you with uh, on this, this note of hunter satisfaction is that we need to recognize that if participation in a co-op uh, can move the hunter satisfaction needle, uh, has, as has been demonstrated in Michigan uh, and elsewhere, it might be the difference, that, that movement of that needle might be the difference between a, a lapsed hunter or even more importantly, um, a lost hunter. So enough with why. Um, just spend a little bit of time on, on talking about um, you know the mechanics of getting a co-op started. And I don't want to spend a good bit of time on that because there are, there are plenty of resources out there. Naturally, the, the, the place to start is to evaluate interest. You know, are folks interested in this? Is this, is this something that that uh, may work in in the area? Get together, talk about that interest, um, develop a set of ground rules and goals that you make it. Uh, set of ground rules and goals, and, and most importantly, I think, uh, from talking to uh, uh, members of different co-ops, you know, make it crystal clear that, uh, number one, participation is always voluntary. Uh, number two, membership does not confer rights, and we've talked about this already, uh, and that is that membership does not confer rights to another's property, equipment, or data, or beer, for that matter, too. Um, and, and finally, it does not diminish the landowner's rights, uh, and I think that needs to be crystal clear that you know these are these are the I guess the foundations, if you will, of, of a set of ground rules. Uh, these three things right here. Lastly, and, and perhaps uh, most importantly, is keep it interesting and fun. And when when we spent a bit of time talking uh, with Kurt Yoder, some of his comments, I think that uh, that became crystal clear that they may have spent a little bit too much time focusing on data. And too little worrying about uh, worrying about fun. So if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about deer hunting cooperatives, there is a good bit of information out there. Uh, uh, most of that, at least that I'm aware of right now, is on the QDMA's website, and you can see that on your screen. You might find things on how to start a QDM cooperative, seven steps, um, how to establish. A, there's another brochure on how to establish a QDM cooperative, and finally developing successful QDM cooperatives. I've also got a, a link to a, uh, an actual cooperative developed in Missouri, developed their own website, and I've provided that link here as well. 
As far as goals, uh, again, uh, really, um, I think no surprises here, uh, improved hunting, a healthy deer population. Hunters would like to, they believe that an increased knowledge of deer and habitat management would be, uh, would be an important goal for, uh, for most co-ops. They want to improve the habitat. Uh, older, age, older buck age structure, of course, tends to be a, a very common theme uh, amongst uh, most co-ops. And more and better data. Um, Co-ops, as I mentioned, allow members to pull harvest and observation records uh, to get a better picture, a more detailed picture of the deer population um, in that area. Moving on uh, to terminology, which I think uh, this is something that I wanted to, uh, as I was going through this and developing the talk, it was something that I came back to after, really after the talk was finished, because I felt like I, I mixed a few terms and I threw, introduced a few terms, perhaps without introduction or definitions. And, so I came back and I put this section in to, uh, to, to address some of, the, uh, some of the terminology issues that I think um, are very, very relevant, but maybe subtle. And, and as I've indicated, uh, as I indicated at the outset, um, a cooperative is really nothing more than a group of people uh, working together. Uh, I've used this term interchangeably uh, throughout the presentation with, with deer management cooperative and just introduced here recently the term QDM cooperative, which likely needs no explanation for at least some in the audience, but for others uh, that might not um, necessarily be the case. So what is the difference, if any, between a, a deer management cooperative and a QDM cooperative? And I think strictly speaking, uh, in most cases, there really are no differences between a QDM cooperative and a, and a deer management cooperative, because in most cases, I think they're reading from the same roadmap and using similar vehicles uh, really to get uh, to a better deer herd and habitat. But, as I mentioned, there are some very relevant subtleties that may warrant uh, that distinction, the distinction between a deer management cooperative and a quality deer management cooperative. And I'd like to, uh, like to take that a little bit further. But to understand these, these subtle differences, I need to introduce uh, yet another term uh, that you've already seen several times, and, and that is QDM. Uh, for those of you who may not know, um, QDM is, is really a philosophy of deer management. I mean, it, it's simply, let me back up just a bit here. QDM is, a, uh, is, is nothing but a deer management philosophy. It's, it is a type of deer management. And I mentioned this uh, just a minute ago with Dan's question. It, it could be contrasted or compared with uh, traditional deer management, um, which is really numbers deer management. I mean, that is what we used uh, in most states to restore deer populations to their, to their current levels or contrast with trophy deer management, which of course is clear at the other end of the spectrum. So the take home message here is that it that really is nothing but a type of deer management, or even more simply, it's a philosophy, it's a deer management philosophy. The cornerstones of, of quality deer management, really there, there are four cornerstones of, of, of the quality deer management philosophy. Number one is herd management, which indicates uh, an adequate doe harvest uh, to balance the deer population with the habitat. Uh, going hand in hand with that is, is improving buck age structure. Typically that means restricting the harvest to uh, generally older age bucks, passing on yearlings using whatever means, uh, antler restrictions, point restrictions, things of that nature. The, other, the next cornerstone is habitat management, providing abundant forage and, and cover. Third is herd monitoring, uh, collecting harvest and, and observation data from the properties that are being, management, uh, being managed. Obviously it makes sense to to collect data uh, to monitor uh, what activities, uh, to monitor activities, determine if you've had any impact, uh, whether it's on the habitat, whether it's on the herd, or both. And finally, uh, the last and perhaps uh, most important, or equally as important, the other cornerstones is hunter management. And there, it basically speaks to educating hunters uh, so that they understand the costs and benefits of the QDM philosophy. So. When you, consider, when you consider the goals and objectives of most co-ops, which we ran through in a, in a, in a, in a previous slide, you'll find complete or, or nearly complete overlap with the cornerstones of the quality of your management philosophy. Um, in, in many cases, unbeknownst to some co-op members, they are, like it or not, um, what I like to call QDM practitioners. So that being the case, that is, there typically is virtually no difference between the goals uh, of, of most co-ops and the QDM cornerstone, the, the cornerstones of the quality deer management philosophy, why not be, you know, call it QDM cooperative and, and be done with it. And I think, uh, from my perspective at least, I think that it minimizes confusion by, by making that separation uh, because 
Um, um, first, not everyone uh, makes the distinction between QDM, uh, a deer management philosophy, as I just said, and, and membership in the Quality Deer Management Association. And for those of you who may not know, uh, the QDMA is a national nonprofit wildlife conservation organization that specializes in education and outreach to hunters, landowners, and natural resource professionals, and whose members embrace the quality deer management philosophy. And as you might imagine, uh, not all QDMA, or not all QDM practitioners are QDMA members, just as not all farmers, of course, are not all Farm Bureau members. So I think that it, it that it, for the reason that it, folks don't necessarily make the distinction between a philosophy of deer management and membership in a national organization, it's probably best to, to make that distinction. Um, making reference, I think, to QDM may be an unnecessary distraction. In other words, I think that it, uh, by making that distinction or not adding the quality qualifier in front of the deer management co-op, um, we minimize information overload. Because if you think about it, we're trying to introduce a new concept that is deer management cooperative. And you're likely to muddy the water, I think, uh, by telling them uh, that they are a QDMer. You know, and the, the reaction may be, hey, listen, you know, I'm just trying to manage deer. I don't want to be anything more than that. And for that reason, I think that it, it, may, um, it may be wise uh, to make that distinction. Because I think, in some cases, uh, deer management cooperative, rather than quality deer management cooperative, may appeal to um, uh, maybe a, a bit more inclusive and appeal to a, a, a wider audience. And finally, to wrap, to wrap this up, um, I think if we take a step back and, and consider uh, that in its simplest form, a cooperative means working or acting together willingly for a common purpose or benefit, um, we may find that on occasion, that common purpose um, may be nothing more than a, a shared dissatisfaction uh, with the state's deer management philosophy, um, or it may involve a desire to intensively manage for trophy deer only. So it, people get together for, for lots of reasons, uh, and it, most of the time it's to improve the deer population and its habitat. Most of the time it involves the cornerstones of the quality deer management philosophy, but not always. So let's let's make that distinction. You know. It, Cooperative is nothing more than people working together. So the point is, as an agency, our goal is first and foremost um, to get neighbors uh, to have a conversation about managing deer to achieve whatever it is that they can't do alone, whether it's QDM or not. Uh, and I think if we cast a simple co-op net rather than a QDM net, uh, our catch is, is likely to be a bit larger. Maybe not, maybe not always, but perhaps. So let's talk just a, a few slides. I'd like, to, I'd like to spend just a couple minutes because it's really nice to have actual, uh, actual feedback from a QDM, or I should say a co-op member here in Coshocton County, Ohio, that's been at this for, for the better part of 10 years. And I really appreciate Kurt Yoder uh, spending a, a few minutes to uh, answer some of these questions for me. But so I asked Kurt, you know, what would you consider doing differently? Uh, and, and Kurt is, a, I don't know that he's necessarily a, the president, if there is a president, but he's, a, he's an active member in the Tiverton Township uh, Co-op, as I mentioned, in, in Coshocton County. And, and Kurt said uh, things that he would do differently, uh, initiate more creative ways of bringing positive, and these are Kurt's words exactly, bringing positive interaction between neighboring landowners. Um, very relevant things. The roots of a local community run deep, and many are skeptical of something new. No surprise here, right? So mix that with generations of neighbors uh, with a past record of animosity, and there's an obvious need to uh, obvious need for the pillar of hunter management. Uh, and he's talking about, in this case, one of the cornerstones of, of the quality deer management philosophy. He also said, I would start with asking for less harvest data and build on that. We started in asking for the collection of lots of observation and harvest data, and it seemed to burn people out. Now we battle with keeping people interested in collecting harvest data need to keep it fun, and, and I emphasized that early on. Um, my apologies, I got ahead of myself there, but as I mentioned, start with asking for less harvest data. It's something that um, uh, I think oftentimes as state agency folks, and this, this may apply more to, uh, to DMAP programs, but also it, it may also uh, transcend, transcend the co-op idea, and that is we think we're going to get mountains of data from, uh, from uh, private landowners whether it's uh, lactation data, whether it's age structure data. Um, the fact is, as Kirk pointed out, you know, if it becomes too much like work, um, it's, not going to be, uh, it's not going to be a very productive co-op. So be careful about thinking uh, you're going to get lots and lots of data. 
Finally, uh, co I asked Kurt how the co-op has grown over the past uh, past decade. And he said they began with 16 landowners uh, with roughly 1,500 acres, and 10 years later they have 26 landowners and nearly 3,100 acres. Uh, the township there, Tiverton Township, is 16,000 acres in size, and roughly 40% of those acres are involved in QDM at some level. How would you characterize hunter satisfaction? Kurt had this to say about that. Hunter satisfaction has only been tracked by the amount of participation from neighboring property owners over the years. And I would say, given the numbers that we've seen above, there must be some satisfaction there, certainly. Uh, the growing number of three and a half year old bucks harvested, certainly another, another metric that they're using to gauge uh, hunter satisfaction in the co-op. And all the participation of property owners in habitat management projects on their farms, as well as uh, the excitement of the annual youth hunt that they sponsor each and every year. So certainly, again, there's that there's that um, there's that fun component. Lastly, what would you never deviate from? Uh, quite simply, our focus on QDM, our quality deer management philosophy, and its four pillars. No need to reinvent the wheel here. Just a solid focus on the basics of herd monitoring, herd management, hunter management, and habitat management. Focus first on hunter management, bringing hunters together with a common goal of QDM, followed up with an ongoing educational event on the three other pillars. So to wrap this up, I'd like to uh, I'd like to address the rhetorical question that I've posed there. And, and are co-ops really a pipe dream or just or a pipe wrench? Do they have a place in the agency's uh, deer management toolbox? And I think there's certainly some out there. Uh, I would be kidding myself if I kidding myself if I didn't uh, if I didn't think this. But I think um, some would argue no, that uh, co-ops really have no place in, in a state agency's uh, toolbox for a couple of reasons. First, uh, some are concerned, uh, as I've mentioned early on, that assisting landowners with deer uh, will only hasten the privatization of deer management on, on private property. And I would argue that perhaps, but since most deer have always been on private property and ac access to them has been controlled by landowners, I'm not really sure how outreach will change this. Uh, the fact is, more than ever before, people want to manage deer, and in my humble opinion, uh, we want them to be as successful as, as they can be. Um, maybe even more importantly, we want them to have realistic expectations, and I think that's that's probably the most important uh, take-home message here uh, of all, and that is realistic expectations for the property, because as I mentioned early on, when folks have unrealistic expectations, it's almost like that direct TV commercial. I could see myself doing that. When you have unrealistic expectations for your property, this happens and that happens, and, and then you get angry with the Deer Program Administrator and life really spirals out of control. It really stinks that I can't hear you laughing. So I'm going to move on and uh, leave, that, leave that one alone. But anyway, on a very, very serious note, I think really, realistic expectations is, is really, really important because that dictates success. And I think if if we have unsuccessful hunters, if we have unsatisfied hunters, um, not even unsatisfied, not, not unsuccessful, I, let me take that back, but, not, but really dissatisfied hunters, hunters that are, that are finding nothing but frustration with their efforts on their property because all their neighbors are shooting all the bucks they're passing and, and all the deer are spending all their time on the neighbor's property for whatever reason, and then we're, we're going to talk about, we're, we're talking about lapsed hunters, we're talking about lost hunters, that's not something that, that we, can, we can afford. So I'm very doubtful that Ohio's deer program will suffer due to people dabbling in deer management, at least not directly. But the indirect fallout, as I said, may be a much bigger issue. The reality is that hunter-landowner satisfaction drives participation, which drives license and permit sales, which drives the bus. And I think with that, you get the point. Lastly, or the second point that I'd like to make here is that while I firmly believe the tools should be in our box, I'm also of, uh, of the opinion that it's foolish to think that this will be uh, the only tool in the toolbox. Um, it's not going to solve all the, uh, all the deer management issues on private property here in Ohio or the Midwest for that matter. Co-ops, as I mentioned early on, are not for everyone, and they are by no means uh, the ticket to retirement for uh, state agency deer staff. In other words, uh, they are not, you know, I'm not going to turn over deer management to private landowners and, and move on to something else. It's just not going to happen. Finally, I'd like to take just a second to thank uh, a few people that made this presentation possible, beginning with Clint McCoy, uh, our new deer biologist. No, Clint, he didn't help me with the presentation, but he did help run the ship while I was off working on this presentation the last few days. So I really appreciate all the work that he did there uh, and his contributions that he's making to the deer program. Emily Flynn, a great friend and, and colleague uh, in Missouri with the deer program there. Uh, she's provided me lots of information on co-ops. Uh, we have a great uh, we 
we have a great exchange program with our information, and, and that's that's really been very helpful for for this presentation and other purposes. As I mentioned, Kurt Yoder was uh, was kind enough to talk to me about uh, his experience there with the uh, the deer management co-op there in Tiverton Township. Amanda Dern for for uh, masterminding this whole thing and making everything work, uh, even with folks like myself. Uh, Ken Dern, who who helped uh, get this project together, uh, and Gabe Carnes, who I mentioned uh, is our postdoc at OSU, who provided uh, much of the uh, the parcel data uh, that I used in this presentation and lots of other things. So. With that, I guess um, we probably, uh, if there are any questions, we certainly have time for that, uh, and I'd be happy to answer those uh, at this time. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Tarkovich. We really appreciate the presentation today. Um, I do have one question. Uh, you gave some resources um, for people if they're interested in uh, enrolling in a co-op. Uh, is there anybody that uh, people can talk to readily, or is there any organization here in Ohio that they can meet and join that will help them? Uh, yeah, you know what? Forming their co-op. A great, a great question. Uh, at my fingertips, I don't have access to um, uh, to the to the co-ops. Uh, the QDMA branch is here in Ohio. Uh, the East Central Branch of the Quality Deer Management Association and others would be a great resource um, for uh, for conversation. At least uh, nothing else. A conversation about getting a co-op started. So I, I would I, I would suggest that if somebody has a particular interest, um, please contact me and I can put them in touch with uh, any of the branches here in the state. I'm, I'm sure that they would be uh, more than happy to talk about it um, with them. And would you be able to scroll through to the slide that um, has the website for QDMA um, so someone can see that link? And um, Dan Long says that there's five branches in Ohio, and you go to qdma.com and seek out the closest branch. Thank you, Dan. And uh, you should see now the, um, the web links uh, on the screen. Great. Thank you. And we have another question. Are co-ops more successful where there's a higher deer population? Well, you know, that's, um, I wouldn't say necessarily that's the case at all when you consider everything that's involved in a, in a co-op. And oftentimes what you might think about uh, in, in areas where you have uh, a large deer population, you might think about a deer management assistance program, which is, isn't necessarily uh, the same thing as, as a co-op. But no, I mean, I, I would think that uh, there's no reason why co-ops would be any more or less successful uh, in areas with higher or low deer populations. Nothing comes to mind immediately. It's really about, you know, I, I guess it's really about relationships. And, and so I, I think if you keep that in mind, it's really, the success is really going to be dictated um, by how you define success, number one, and I think uh, number two, um, establishing a very clear and defined set of ground rules uh, at the outset. So deer populations really should not dictate whether or not uh, there is any interest or really dictate success, because I think, as I said, success is going to be a, a function of how you define it. Mm -hmm. um, another question here. Um, other than educational outreach efforts, is there any other assistance that Division of Wildlife um, is offering or plans to offer for co-ops? Right now, Amanda, I would say no. I mean, I think the, uh, the steps that we're trying to take right now are, are really, first and foremost, to perhaps um, get our own staff, our own agency staff, up to speed on co-ops so that they can talk about co-ops when the conversation comes up. Um, because there's really nothing fancy about co-ops. It's just all of a sudden the light clicks one day and, and you realize, well, I guess I've been talking about co-ops all, all along. I never realized that we were talking about co-ops. I was just <laughs> talking to landowners about, you know, working together to do something, you know, to achieve goals that they have in common with each other. So mm -hmm. assessing interest is the first and foremost uh, thing that we're trying. Well, bu building, a, building a knowledge base at the grassroots level uh, is, is important. And then if the interest uh, does, if there appears to be a great deal of interest, then, of course, um, that's reason enough to take this, to the next step and begin thinking about, you know, do we want to have our private lands biologist or have our wildlife specialist perhaps more engaged in, in working with private landowners? Or uh, ideally, uh, I'd like to see us, uh, if, if the interest is great enough, perhaps um, model um, uh, a co-op position after Missouri and, and hire someone, you know, a joint relationship with either the Quality Deer Management Association or perhaps funded through Whitetails Unlimited or something jointly where we actually have a go-to person in the state dedicated to working on uh, developing co-ops. Um, 
How would a co-op function adjacent to public land? That's a great question. Uh, I think it, uh, there's no reason why it could not. Uh, in fact, I know that um, there are some folks in southwest Ohio that are looking at developing a co-op that's butting up against public land. Now, of course, what that would mean is that uh, there would likely have to be, um, be typically what's going to happen in a, in a co-op situation is there's probably going to be some mandates, some harvest mandates, either restriction on on uh, antlers, you know, buck age structure, or, and there may be a ramped up, uh, there may be a ramped up doe harvest. So, not to say that it can't be done, of course, but it certainly would involve cooperation, if you will, between <laughs> the public land ent entity and the adjacent private property. But that's not a hurdle that I think we can't get over. And in fact, uh, to, to speak to that, I think if you go go to uh, the, the U.S. Fish, the, uh, the QDMA website, you may find some information, and, and if not, I know that it's available somewhere because Matt Ross just recently spoke about the, the, um, the co-ops that are being developed between U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, National Wildlife Refuges, and, uh, and adjacent private property. So certainly can be done, just, uh, just uh, I guess, a bit more detail involved. Um, I just wanted to point out a chat that I just sent to everyone um, that Dan Long had sent that they're starting a QDM cooperative in eastern Knox County. So if anyone is interested in that, um, there's some his email there to contact him for details. Thank you, Dan, for that. And then uh, another question, how do we keep this from becoming a lease lock of properties? Um, it seems that this is from Dean Sinclair, that um, in southeast Ohio it seems to be a hunting land grab. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. We're talking about, uh, I, I'm not sure that, um, so I can't imagine, you know, you've got a, a block of, uh, a block of say, 12 adjacent uh, property owners that decide they want to form a co-op and then all of a sudden turn that over to a lease. Um, I, I don't know, if maybe that's not what, Dean, you're getting at, but uh, certainly I don't see people doing that. And if they did, uh, I really, I don't know what it changes because that's still private property. There was never unlimited access to that property either before or af after it was leased, so I'm not sure. Uh, I think there's actually <laughs> there's actually a few things that we may have done to encourage leasing um, that fortunately did not pan out. But I think it's got leasing has got enough traction in and of its own right that uh, there's not a lot that we're going to do. Certainly not, you know, trying to get folks to talk about uh, working together to achieve a common goal is certainly going to encourage leasing. Uh, one of the things that we may have done as an agency was try with our Hunt Ohio Farms program where, where we were trying to link um, landowners with um, uh, with hunters. Uh, that was a situation there was, where it certainly could have led to a, a leasing program. But as I said, I think just the quality of hunting opportunities in Ohio um, is is fueling this lease uh, this lease issue uh, in and of itself. The other thing that I would speak speak to the lease issue and access in this in this conversation is that it's really not all about leasing. I think if you look at the if you look at the numbers, uh, Dean. Uh, many folks are buying private property. Many of those people who are, are residents of Ohio are buying private property exclusively uh, for hunting rights of their own. Uh, and so we're, it's a double whammy. I mean, people that are, 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 are leasing land uh, sometimes to folks in Ohio, other times to folks out of the state, but at the same time what we've also got going on is people recognizing I need a place to hunt for myself and my kids. I'm going to buy a piece of property and all of a sudden that, uh, that access is, is now zero uh, except, for, except for the owners. So, don't see how uh, forming a, uh, uh, and again, I may have totally missed the question here, Dean, how forming a co-op could necessarily encourage leasing, uh, but if I have missed the boat, please uh, leave that again. And um, Dan asked if, if he might um, be unmuted for a moment to talk about that opportunity. Is, is that um, okay with you, Mike? That'd be fine. All right. I'm gonna... Okay, Dan, you should be unmuted now. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I can hear you fine, Dan. Okay. Hey, Mike. Uh, good to be on. Uh, yeah, I'd like to address Dean's question uh, specifically. The land grabs are going to happen regardless if you have a co-op or not. and It's already started. And, and what a lot of people are seeing are some of these big companies come in, Mossy Oak Properties, Whitetail Properties, et cetera, et cetera, and they're already grabbing the property, uh, enhancing it, and then reselling it for big dollars. Um, <clears throat> we have found that cooperatives can actually prevent that because you're actually teaching the people that own the property or folks, local folks that may lease the property and and in the same point they're they're not requiring someone else to come in but they're actually gaining a hold of the property themselves and managing it themselves instead of you know turning it over or they're convincing a landowner not to turn it over to a big company or to lease it 
Um, but if they if the landowner is going to want money, you're going to have to pay them money. But at this point, they can build a long-term relationship with that landowner, and you're not seeing a lease flop over every two to three years. And those people trust the people that's that's on the property. They trust the co-op. They trust the unity and the teamwork going on, and they will never have to look outside of those that team. And that's the whole part of that's the benefit of a co-op is the landowners trust you, law enforcement trusts you. You actually enhance all that, and you can prevent some of these bigger companies and these guys with a lot of money in their pocket coming in and disrupting that teamwork. That's what we're trying to enhance, and and, and that's one benefit of the QDM because they do have a code of ethics and you can show that to a landowner and say, hey, here are the rules that I follow and it gives them just a little more framework. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that clarification. Very good points. All right. Um, well, we don't have any other questions at the moment, but um, we can probably take one more. And um, again, please do um, check out our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash OBCI1. Um, the meeting uh, recording will be up there by the end of the week, and we also invite you to view all of our other um, meeting past meeting recordings. And please do continue to check um, obcinet.org for a listing of upcoming webinars in this series. So thank you again, Mike, and um, hope that you'll all join us for our next webinar in the series. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in. Thank you.